Good morning, church. I am Paul. I am the baldest pastor here at Green Ridge. And today, we're starting a new series in the book of Genesis. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and crack them open to the very first page of the biblical text this morning. We're going to start in Genesis 1, 1. The plan for this series is to work through the whole book in about six months, and I'm really excited. Uh, I'm excited because we're going to spend a lot of time in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is kind of my thing. It's my jam. I love the Old Testament. Uh, I'm also excited because of what I hope that this story is going to, or what I hope that this study is going to do for us. So... um, a little bit of embarrassing story time. I went to Scott County Central High School, uh, which is a very small rural public school in Southeast Missouri. And we had two sports to choose from. We had basketball and we had baseball. If you were a girl, it was softball. We didn't have football. We didn't have soccer. We didn't have lacrosse or swimming. We didn't even have track (laughs) because we didn't have a track to run around. It was baseball and basketball. Well, the the basketball players were actually really good. Um, The basketball team won several state championships in Missouri. Um, And so I knew I was never really going to have a chance to play anything in basketball. But the baseball team, on the other hand, was actually really, really bad. So uh, I thought I might actually have a chance to, to play a little bit there. So I started baseball at Scott Central in ninth grade. In church, I was terrible. I was a terrible baseball player. I couldn't hit the ball. I couldn't throw the ball. Uh, I did not want to play infield because, man, that ball comes off that aluminum bat really, really fast. And I didn't want to be anywhere in the infield when that happened. I wasn't too terribly slow, and I could catch the ball half the time, and so the outfield was okay. But all of the rest of it, I was just so bad. In fact, I sat in the dugout my first two years. Unless, of course, uh, we were losing bad enough to where if you put me in, it wouldn't really matter. Uh, And then I got to play in right field. I'm pretty confident that I hold the honor of being the worst baseball player on the worst baseball team probably in the whole state of Missouri. But listen, church, before I started playing baseball in ninth grade, I had never played any kind of organized baseball in my life. I didn't play t-ball I didn't play Little League. I didn't play anything. And that means that I had never had any kind of formal coaching in any of the fundamentals of baseball. My baseball coach in high school actually said that when I threw, it looked weird. (laughs) I don't even know what that means. In fact, I had so little experience with the fundamentals of baseball that during the first game that I was going to finally start in my junior year, right before the game started, when we were throwing the ball around in the outfield, I lost the ball in the sun and I didn't even have enough mental awareness to duck. So a baseball busted me in the mouth. It broke teeth out. It split my lip down the middle. It was, it was pretty bad. I totally lacked the fundamentals of baseball, and I got busted in the face. Church, I'm excited that we're going to do a long study of the book of Genesis, because Genesis gives us some of the rock-bottom fundamentals of who God is and who we are in relationship to him. And let's be honest, friends, some of us church folks really lack an understanding of some of those fundamentals of God because we just don't do a lot with the whole Old Testament. We don't know what to do with it. It's difficult. It's big. It's kind of weird. And so we tend to avoid the Old Testament. And because we lack these fundamentals, when the world throws us some weird idea about God or about humanity, it 
busts us in the face. We start questioning things about God or we start shifting what we think about humanity away from what the Bible says toward whatever the world is saying that day. We need these fundamentals found in the Old Testament. They're good for us. They help us to field the weird ideas that the world throws at us. So, the the way that we've broken up the book of Genesis for this series is we've broken it up into story arcs. Genesis as a whole is one big story that fits into the even bigger story of the whole Bible. But the book of Genesis is also made up of a bunch of little stories. And so we're going to kind of chunk up the stories, uh, we're going to kind of chunk up the series into these story arcs so that it's a little bit easier to wrap our heads around. The first story arc that we find runs from Genesis 1 through Genesis chapter 11. And that's the first story arc we're going to tackle in the series. And we're calling this one, He is, We Are. These chapters tell us some of the most fundamental, some of the most important and basic things about God. They tell us who he is and they tell us about humanity, who we are. So for the next five weeks or so, we're going to work through this big story arc from Genesis chapter one through Genesis chapter 11. And today we start at the beginning. If the Old Testament gives us the fundamentals of who God is, then Genesis, and specifically Genesis chapters 1 and 2, give us some of the most fundamental fundamentals about who God is and who we are. Today we're going to focus on the fundamental idea that God is creator and we are creatures. He is creator. We are creatures. God is the only being in all of existence that wins the title of uncreated. He is the only thing that is self-existent. He's the only being that just is. He doesn't need anything else in order for him to be. He, He has always been, he is right now, and he will always be. Literally everything else is 100% dependent on God for its existence. Nothing else would exist if it weren't for him and for his creating power, which means that before God began to create, there was nothing but God. Just God, in all of his triune glory, in all of his powerful justice, in all of his perfect holiness, just God. And and he wasn't lonely. He wasn't incomplete. He was perfectly whole. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit existing in perfect, eternal holiness, and love. And that's actually where Genesis 1:1 picks up. In the beginning God created. In Hebrew this phrase is just three words long. Bereshit bara Elohim. But it's three words that will define the rest of history. Because what these three words capture is all of God's terrifying power exploding out of his being and causing all of the things of life to sweep into the nothingness. The first point for us today is that as creator, God shows his power. As creatures, we stop and praise. If there was ever a time when God's raw, unmitigated power was put on full display, it was at creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. My idea about Genesis 1-1 is a little bit different uh, than what some would hold, but it's it's certainly within the realm of orthodoxy, so don't worry. But I think verse 1 is actually God's initial creative act, where he calls the raw materials of the universe and of the earth into existence. 
One of the big reasons for this is because uh, there's no mention in the rest of chapter 1 about God creating the planet or, or water on the planet. In verse 2, the earth is just there. And, and the Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters on the earth. Then he separates the waters in verse 6. He gathers the waters in verse 9. And there's no mention of him creating the, the globe or the waters on the globe. But I think that all of that actually happens in verse 1. When I read Genesis 1-1, there's one moment in history where God, boom, does his first act of creation. And then after that, in the rest of chapter 1, he demonstrates the kind of power that God uses to bring order and beauty to the universe. On the first day, God imagines light. He thinks it up. He invents it in his mind, and then he speaks, and it just starts existing. Then uh, he also makes a distinction between light and darkness, keeping the darkness around as a counterbalance to his new invention of light. On the second day, he starts forming and shaping the earth. He, and he, he takes a few God-sized handfuls of the oceans and he throws them toward the heavens and he makes the sky. On day three, God moves and shifts the oceans to their special spot, and then he lines them with beaches. Then he, he pulls up the Himalayas, and he pushes down the Grand Canyon. And after he reveals the land, he plants plants. All of the oaks and maples and redwoods and blueberry bushes and tulips and Venus flytraps and dandelions. All the vegetation of the earth, every single one of them a beautiful and awesome invention of God's imagination. And when we come to the end of day three, one thing that Old Testament scholars like to point out is that the literary structure of Genesis 1 up to this point reveals that God's choices so far have been beautifully intentional. So far, he's, what he's made are domains. And now he's going to fill those domains with inhabitants over the next three days. Remember on day one, God made light and he separated it from the darkness. But on day four, God breathes out the sun, moon, and stars and he makes them dwell in the light and the darkness. On day two and the early part of day three, remember, God made the sky and he gathered the oceans into their place. But on day five, he fills those domains with flying creatures and sea creatures. At the end of day three, God prepares the land by uncovering it and seeding it with all plant life. But on day six, he covers the earth with land animals and with humanity who feed on the plants. Listen, church, God is the creator and his terrifying and beautiful power can be seen in every part of the world that he's created. From Niagara Falls to tornadoes in the Midwest to the graceful blue whale swimming in the ocean to the subtle miracle of a baby forming in her mother's womb. God caused all of those things by his power. And Genesis 1 and 2 are calling us to stop and remember the incredible power that our God has and that he put on display in making the world. These chapters are calling us to stop and appreciate the world around us as God's handiwork. And the Bible is very clear about the kind of response that his creatures, that we are supposed to have to that power. Psalm, uh, Psalm 19, the heavens do what? They declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Church, all of creation responds night and day to God's total power that he displayed at creation. They all respond to him with 
with praise, with worship, with glory, with honor, with attention, with devotion, all directed to him. Why? Because he alone is the creating God who says, let it be, and it happens. Church, as creator, God shows his power. As creatures, we stop and praise. When's the last time that you stopped to appreciate God's creation and give him praise for it? Maybe it was this morning, maybe on the way to church or when we were singing these songs this morning. Maybe it was this week sometime when you took a walk or looked at the stars or watched your kids play in the backyard. Maybe you haven't done it in a while. Church, let me encourage you to make this a part of your day. Look, summer is coming up and there's no reason for you not to get outside and enjoy what God has made. God has built this stunningly beautiful place for you to live in. And whether you like them or not, God has created some pretty amazing animals to observe. And whether you like them or not, God has created some pretty amazing people for you to be around. Don't forget to look around and remember how awesome God is for creating all of this. And don't forget to give him the praise that he deserves for it. The second thing we learn from these fundamental chapters of Genesis today is that as creator, God cares and provides. As creatures, we trust and give thanks. We've seen this a little bit already in the diligence that God takes to prepare creation. He makes domains and then he fills those domains with inhabitants. And he doesn't place creatures on the earth until everything is ready to receive them. God has definitely shown his care and provision in chapter 1, but as most of you know, the creation story doesn't end in chapter 1. Genesis chapter 2 is an extension and really an elaboration of some of the creation story in chapter 2. In Genesis, uh, in chapter 1, in Genesis 2, the author shifts from the power that God displays in creating the atoms and the stars, and he zeroes in on the care and provision that God displays when he creates humanity. After God had completed the rest of his creative tasks, look at the care that he treats humanity with. Genesis chapter 2, look at verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Now jump down to verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. First, in verse 7, Old Testament scholars like to point out that the word that is used to describe the creation of humanity here in chapter 2 is different from the word that was used to describe the rest of creation. Back in chapter 1, God creates, period. Almost as if the idea is that God simply brings his power to bear and the galaxy just kind of pops into existence. That's kind of the idea of the word create in Genesis chapter 1. But here in chapter 2, what does it say about humanity? It says that he formed the man from the dust. And the picture we get with this is almost that God was on his hands and knees in the dirt, gathering up the dust and forming it and shaping it into the shape of man. And then in a very personal and intimate way, God breathes out the breath of life into those newly formed lungs and they receive life directly from the mouth of God. Then what does God do? He, he immediately goes out and he plants a garden. And I love that it says that God planted the garden. Again, we get this picture of him down in the dirt with his glory gloves and his trinity trowel making room in the soil for just the right plants for his garden. 
And then he puts the man in that God-planted garden. God prepared a paradise for humanity to live in, and then he shuttles him directly there. God gave him everything he was going to need to live and thrive. And then, down in verse 15, he gives him meaningful work. The man is given a share in the responsibility to cultivate the world around him. Just as God has brought thriving to the man, so the man was to bring thriving to his environment. He wasn't supposed to be idle and worthless. He had a job. He had a purpose. He had meaning. But then in verse 18, we hear that not everything is good. After so many times in chapter 1 that it says that it was good, it was good, it was good, God says this in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And then after the man discovers that nothing in all creation was like him, verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. God creates a companion for man who complements and corresponds to him perfectly. God creates woman. And earlier in chapter 1, it says that these two together, man and woman, male and female, both parts of humanity together were both made in the image of God. Church, when God created, he demonstrated that he is a God who cares? He's a God who knows our needs and he gives generously to meet those needs. Life, sustenance, meaningful work, perfect companionship. God saw all the things that humanity needed to thrive and he gave it. Friend, God knows your need. And he knows how he's going to fill it. Just like he's always done from the time of creation, God continually shows his love and care and compassion to his people. I have maybe a dozen instances from my own life, just since I've been married, of how God has given us just what we needed at just the right time. One of the most recent ones was that our, our black Dodge van was, was basically done for. The guy at the shop said, look, you can pay me to fix it, but if this were my vehicle, I would just get rid of it. And <laughs> if the guy at the shop was telling me that, I knew that we were in a pretty bad situation. So, so I went home and I, I told Alana and that night church, I, I was really just kind of stressing about it because I, I had no idea what we were going to do. I, I, I just didn't know. And church, I'm not lying to you. The very next morning, a family member texted me who, who, who never texts me. And they said, hey, we have a van for you guys if you want it. Church, <laughs> we hadn't told anyone. That was the hand of God providing for our needs. Amen? Amen. God saw and God provided. And I'm willing to bet that if we took the time this morning to hear from everyone in the room, we would hear hundreds of stories like that of God providing just what we needed at just the right time. Do you remember those times in your life? When God sent that little extra money that met the need just perfectly. What about the time when God sent that person with the perfect thing to say just when you needed it? When God gave you that perfect idea to solve that huge problem you were struggling with? As creator, God cares and provides. As creatures, we trust 
and give thanks. He is the perfect caregiver. He is the perfect provider, and he knows what we need before we even ask him, Jesus says in Matthew 6. And the best response to his care, church, the best response to his provision is to trust him, to give him thanks. He has provided for you in the past. You can trust that he'll provide for you in the future. Have you thanked God recently for his provision? Friends, I would encourage you, don't let this service end today before you've given God the praise he deserves for taking care of you. Finally, today, as creator, God commands for our good. As creatures, we obey for his glory. As creator, God commands for our good, as creatures we obey for his glory. Back in Genesis chapter 2 now, after, after showing us all of his incredible power and after showing us all of his kindness and caring, we also see that God issues commands. Look at verse 16 of Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, lots and lots of people throughout human history have wondered, what in the world is God doing here? They ask things like, isn't this command arbitrary? Or, or what was so special about that tree? Or why did God even make that tree if he knew it was all just going to end in sin and death? And we don't have time this morning to dig into all of the questions about these verses, but I do want to give you a few thoughts. Do you see what the forbidden tree is called? What's its name? It's very important. It's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. By eating from it, the eater would come to know what it was to do good and to do evil. And it's not because the fruit had some kind of like magical mind altering effect, like a weird mushroom. It's because as soon as someone eats from it, they will have broken the command of God and then they will really know what it was to do evil. They will know evil because now they will be living in it. By placing that tree in the garden and forbidding it, God was giving humanity a choice. He was saying, look, you can trust me and I, I will tell you everything that is good and right and I will tell you everything that is wrong and evil. I will tell you all of that myself. You can trust me to tell you all of that and I will never lie to you. But trust without a test is not really trust. So you also have the option of finding out on your own what is good and evil. But listen, your heart will deceive you. Your mind will deceive you. You are not a perfect, all-knowing being. So if you choose to walk down that path of finding out what good and evil is on your own, then you will open yourself up to all of the lies that sin and Satan will throw at you. And you will get lost along the way. By placing that tree in the garden and forbidding it, God was giving humanity a choice. Trust him and live Trust yourself and die. Church, God's commands have always and only ever been for our good. Our whole series before Easter was guardrails. Obeying God's commands and protecting our worship and works. Obeying God's commands because that protects us and blesses us. As creator, he commands for our good, always for our good. And because his commands are always good for us, church, the logical response is to obey him. 
What command of God are you clearly disobeying today? Maybe you've felt it in your bones over the last little while that you're disobeying the commands of God, but you're, you're still trying to decide for yourself what's best. You're still trying to decide for yourself what's good and evil. You're still trying to do all of that on your own, but friend, stop, stop. Obey God. His commands are meant to give you life and lead you to peace. He has already told you what is good and right. Fighting against his good commands will only lead to your heartache and ruin. Stop fighting him. Stop fighting him and obey God. And in doing that, you will find your good. And you will give him glory for it. Church, he is creator. We are creatures. As creator, God shows his power. As creatures, we stop and praise. As creator, God cares and provides. As creatures, we trust and give thanks. As creator, God commands for our good. As creatures, we obey for his glory. Let's pray. Holy Father, I, I'm so thankful for the word of God that it teaches us the fundamental things about you and about us. I'm thankful, God, that you are the creator, that you are good and powerful. I thank you, God, that we are creatures and that, that you care for us, you provide for us, you instruct us, you lead us, you demonstrate your power to us. Father, I pray that we would take the word this morning and that we would sink it deep into our souls. And Father, you would help us to submit to you and to run to you and to trust you and to obey you as our good creator. Give us grace to do that this week. In Jesus' name, amen.